Mr. Puckett had already gone out to work in the cornfield, but Ma and the youngins, Mary and John and Alfred and Lulu, were still at the breakfast table. They were trying to eat their sausages, but not doing very well at it. Mostly, they were just pushing them around their plates because the sausages didn't have any flavor. The pepper in them was flat and tasteless. I declare, said Ma, it's a mystery to me why your pa can't grow good hot peppers. The Callaways have good peppers and the honey cuts in the Tates. Seems like everybody in the mountains can grow real good hot peppers. Except your pa. I just don't understand it. Maybe the ground ain't right, said Mary, who was 14 years old. That ain't it, Ma said. He's planted them here and there, a different part of the farm every year, and they always turn out the same. Poor weak plants with only a few puny little peppers, as tasteless as sawdust. Does he plow good and deep? Asked John, who was 12. Does he put on plenty of fertilizer? Asked Alfred, who was eight. Does he plant the seed early in the morning while the ground is wet? Chirped Lulu, who was six. He does everything just right, Ma told them. He does everything just like other folks. But their fields will have big, red, healthy peppers, full of sting, and Pa's will be just the same as ever. Mary shook her head sadly while John and Alfred and Lulu looked downhearted. It was too bad about Pa's peppers. Folks in the backwoods needed good hot peppers. Every cabin had two or three strings of them hanging in the kitchen beside the bunches of dried string beans called leather breeches and the garlands of onions with their tails plaited tight together. Red pepper sprinkled on the meat after it was killed in the wintertime helped to preserve it. And what good was a pot of turnip greens and fat bacon in the spring without a dose of good hot pepper vinegar? That pepper vinegar cut the grease and made the dinner set well on the stomach. And sausages? Without red pepper, a sausage wasn't a sausage at all. Ma and the youngins looked down at their sausages. They just weren't fit to eat. It's enough to make a preacher mad, Alfred said. Nothing ever riles your pa. He's the mildest man I ever saw. If Mr. Tate had a pepper crop, turn out the way ours does, he'd be yelling and kicking up a dust storm about it. Mr. Calloway, too, and Mr. Honeycutt, they'd be stomping around something terrible. But not your pa. He's never lost his temper in his life. And now he's going to plant peppers tomorrow? Mary asked. Ain't that what he said? I just wish I knew what to do to break his bad luck. Listen, Ma. Mary leaned forward and whispered across the table. Why don't we go to see the granny witch? Let's go over to Black Oak Ridge and ask her how come Pa can't seem to grow good peppers. Oh, my. Ma looked shocked. It's a far piece over to Black Oak Ridge, objected Ma. Well, I haven't ever been to a granny witch. Never in my whole life. Come on, Ma. Let's go before the sun gets high. The mother thought to herself for a moment. I've tried everything else. I guess it wouldn't do any harm. The children jumped up with a yell. We'll have to fix up a snack to eat along the way. You get at it, youngins, while I straighten up the house. Ma got up and began to bustle around, washing the dishes and fixing up the cabin. The children sliced some ham and put it between biscuits. They wrapped them in corn husks and packed them in a basket. Then they were ready to go. I'll have to carry the granny witch a present, Ma said. If you want a granny witch to help you out, you'd better have something for her. Now what should we take? She looked at the children. A mess of collard greens from the garden, Mary said. And a rutabaga, John added. That's just the thing. It was a fine day, and off they set footing it over the mountains. The children went zigzagging up the steep sides and scampering along the ridges with Ma puffing on behind. Then they went down the other side. Along creeks and brooks they waded, splashing and scaring the minnows, and along toward noon they came to Black Oak Ridge where the granny witch lived. They all huddled fearful like in front of a small cave. I declare, Ma said, maybe we ought to go on back home and not bother this old woman. She may not like having folks come visiting. Shucks, Ma. Go on and call her. She's just an old woman. Maybe she's lonesome for company, Mary said. I don't see any vegetable garden around here, said Alfred. Maybe she's craving some collard greens. Maybe she is, Ma said, as she began to feel braver. She looked toward the cave and squeaked out, Granny, are you in there? What do you want? replied a cracked old voice in the cave. Ma's eyes got big, but she called again. Come out, Granny. We've got a little something for you. 
Out came an old soul as skinny as a fence rail. Ma went and offered her the collard greens and the rutabaga. Well, I do thank you. The old woman was bright-eyed and spry-looking. She took what Ma offered. I've been hankering for something like this for the longest time. Now what can I do to help you? To tell the truth, Granny, I've come to see if you can tell me why my husband can't ever raise a good crop of red peppers. And she went on to explain how puny his peppers turned out every year and how tasteless they were. I'm surprised you come all this way to ask me a thing like that, said the Granny Witch. It's so simple you ought to know it yourself. Ma and the youngins looked surprised. Your husband must be a mild man, ain't he? Granny asked. He sure is. He don't lose his temper like a lot of men I know. He never goes feuding and shooting at his neighbors. No matter what they do, if they do him an injury, he just forgives them. Oh, he's a mild-mannered man, all right. There you are. That's the reason. The granny witch bobbed her head up and down. A man like that can't raise hot peppers. They'll turn out just like he is every time. Mild and gentle. It takes a hot-tempered man to raise hot peppers. You ought to know that. Well, for a little spell, Ma looked down, thoughtful-like. She scuffed at the rocks with one foot. Then she looked up at the old woman. What can I do about it? Come in, Granny beckoned to Ma with a skinny finger. Come in all by yourself and I'll put a flea in your ear. Ma looked around at the young'uns, fearful-like. You stay right here, she whispered. Wait till I come out. And if I don't come out, you go and get Pa and all the neighbors. Then, into the cave, marched Ma behind the old woman. The children stood there, holding on to each other, and wondering if they would ever see their Ma again. But pretty soon, here she came, smiling, safe and sound, and large as life. She had a secret, knowing the look on her face. The old granny came behind her, grinning and showing all her snag teeth. Ma thanked her and told her goodbye. Then the troop set off for home. What did she say, Ma? The children begged. Tell us what she said. Did she give you a charm? Did she make a witch spell for Pa? Never you mind. You'll find out soon enough. Now just be quiet about this trip. Don't say a word to Pa. You hear me? That night, while they were eating their fried pork and cornbread, Pa sighed. I'm going to plant the pepper crop tomorrow morning. We ought to get a real early start before the sun gets up. You better get things in order tonight, Ma, and have breakfast ready early. I reckon if we get those plants in real early so the hot sunshine doesn't get to them, the peppers will turn out better. He shook his head in a hopeless way, as if he didn't really believe it would help. That night after they were all asleep, Ma crept out of bed and made some preparations. She worked a while very quietly in the shed while they were all sleeping. Then she went into the kitchen and climbed on a chair. She worked there for a while. Then she went out onto the porch and thumped and thudded a while in the dark. Then she brushed her hands together, smiled to herself, and went back to bed. The next morning, Pa woke up with the earliest cock crow. It was just getting light outside. He sat up in bed and sang out, Ma, all you youngins, get up. Hurry now. We gotta get an early start on those peppers. He hopped out of bed in the half dark and began to pull on his pants. He tried and tried to get his foot through the leg, but it wouldn't go through. What in the world is going on here? He wondered. The children sat up in bed. Their eyes were round with surprise as they watched their father hopping around, trying to make his foot go through his trouser leg. When one foot wouldn't go, Pa tried the other, but that wouldn't go either. Then, while they watched, he sat down on the side of the bed and examined his pant legs. Somebody had tied a tight knot in the bottom of each leg. Those darn young'uns. This ain't no time to be playing tricks. I don't got time to be sitting here untying knots. But the kids didn't do it. Well, get up now and make haste. We've got to get those peppers planted. He put his feet into his shoes and stood up. But when he started to walk off, his feet wouldn't move. He tried and tried, but his feet wouldn't come off the floor. Now, What's the matter here? I can't get my feet off the floor, but I ain't paralyzed. There he stood, pulling and pulling, but his feet wouldn't come off the floor. The children were too amazed by the strange actions to get out of bed. They just sat there staring at him, straining to get his feet off the floor. Then all of a sudden, 
One of Pa's feet came out of a shoe. His knee came up and smacked himself real good on the chin. Pa clapped his hand to his chin. His other foot came out of the shoe, and he went hopping around the room. He got down on the floor and examined his shoes. Someone had nailed them to the floor, hard and tight. What are y'all up to? He turned to the kids. You ought not hold things up on a day like this, when I've laid off to plant the peppers. You ought to have more respect for your pa than to tie knots in his pants and nail his shoes to the floor. But the children were clueless and just looked at one another wide-eyed. Ma, it's already sun up. We've got to get the peppers planted. Get up now and fix the breakfast. I'm not going to cook any breakfast today. Get in there and cook your own if you want it, his wife replied. Well, my goodness, she must have taken sick, the husband thought to himself, since she never acted like that. No, I ain't sick, but I'm tired of getting up and cooking every day of my life. Today I'm going to stay in bed, so just leave me be. He knew better, thanked a poke a mama bear, so he turned to the kids. Somebody's got to help me plant those peppers. The children hopped out of bed and hurried into their clothes. No time to eat breakfast now. I'll just have a cup of coffee. That'll tide me over till dinner time. He went into the kitchen and blew on the coals. He looked in the coffee can. There was just enough coffee for one cup, so he dumped it in the pot and set the pot on the fire. In only a moment, the coffee was bubbling and had the whole cabin smelling good. The aspiring farmer poured it into a cup and put three heaping teaspoons of sugar in it. I sure need this, he thought to himself, especially with everything going on in this cabin this morning. Just then, he blew into his cup and cooled the liquid a bit. Then he took a good big swallow. Suddenly his eyes bugged out and his cheeks puffed out like a balloon. Quickly, he ran to the door and blew the coffee all over the yard. I got a good mind to wear them young'uns hides out for this. He steamed. What's wrong, Pa? They asked. You know good and well what's wrong. You put salt in the sugar jar. Disgusted, he unlatched the kitchen door and pushed it open. Just then, a bucket of cold water fell all over his head. Someone had tied a bucket to a nail over the door, just waiting on him to open it. The children began to giggle. Look at this mess. Now I got to change my clothes. The young'uns waited on the porch, and a few minutes later, Pa returned. Darn it, the sun's already up, he scoffed. He moved quickly across the porch and started down the steps, but he didn't notice that the plank was removed from the bottom one. Crash, down he went, flat on his face sprawled out on the dirt. The children clapped their hands over their mouths, but couldn't keep from laughing. You think that's funny? I'll teach you to play pranks on me, he said as he snatched a switch from the peach tree. But all the young'uns ran for the woods, and the fired up man couldn't catch any of them. Just then, Ma came out. Are you going to plant those peppers or not? Pa stood there sweating and just plumb mad, clean through. All right, all right. Enough of this foolishness. So he set out to work, and the children fell in behind him. Up one row they went and down another. Pa and Mary tilled the ground, while Alfred and Lulu dropped the plants in, and John finished up by hoeing dirt around each plant. No body had eaten breakfast, and all of them were feeling pretty mean. But onward, they continued in the hot sun, all the way till dinner time, when the work was finally finished. Just as the exhausted man sat down for dinner, he looked out the window and saw a drove of hogs, who were busy rooting up every row of the newly planted peppers. He nearly choked on his food before he set out with a hoe chasing those hogs. After 30 minutes of chasing them, the field was a disaster and he walked back to the cabin. Just then, his wife started on him. You sure made a mess of that pepper patch. What? Blame it on me, will you? You wouldn't even fix me breakfast and I worked all day. He wasn't about to sit around and let her start in on him, so back out in the field he went. Hungry, thirsty, and mad as fire, he worked till sunset, planting those peppers. And how did those peppers finally turn out? Well, Mr. Puckett set a record that year. He grew the hottest peppers ever seen or heard of in the mountains. The plants grew up as most high as his head, and they were so hot, folks didn't even dare to go into the pepper patch for fear of getting burned. When it rained, you could see the water sizzling when it fell on those peppers. It ran down the rows like it had been poured out of a boiling kettle and scalded all the weeds. That's right, he didn't have to do no weeding the entire year. And when the peppers started to ripen, they shone like chunks of red-hot iron. 
In the nighttime, it was a sight to see. The whole field was full of red lights. Come picking time, you couldn't touch one without getting burned, without using fire tongs. And come winter time, those sausages were so hot, the youngins couldn't gulp them down without burning their throats. Ma finally admitted it wasn't a good idea to get Pa that mad again. Next time, she'd just get him half mad and the peppers would be just right. Thank you.